to be honest, I'm not a real pediatric anesthesiologist because I do only pediatric anesthesia in orthopedic patients, and most of the time these children are above the age of one year. But in our hospital, we have special pediatric anesthesiologists who do the only the real pediatric anesthesia. So I consider myself not as a real pediatric anesthesiologist. So after having heard a lot of new things, I think I have nothing new to tell, maybe little new things to tell, because all the things you've heard are also applicable to children. So I narrow my talk a little bit to upper and lower extremity blocks in children. Um, regional anesthesia is very effective, more effective than systemic analgesics. Maybe sometimes systemic opioids are contraindicated in children because of the opioid-induced respiratory depression. Some children are even tolerant to opioids. And rigid anesthesia provides better pain relief against visceral pain. Moreover, a, pain, a child which is pain-free is much more better for psychological reasons for both child and parents. So we've seen a lot of changes in rigid anesthesia the last, in children in the last decades. You see a decrease in neuroaxial blocks, and you see an increase in peripheral nerve blocks. And maybe this is also because of the introduction of ultrasound rigid anesthesia. But still, also in my hospital, some pediatric anesthesiologists are very reluctant in using rigid anesthesia in pediatric patients. Why? There's fear for complications. But if you look at the incidence of complications uh, of rigid anesthesia in children, the risk is very low. And this low risk should actually encourage anesthesiologists to use rigid anesthesia. And some colleagues say, oh, your blocks doesn't work, your block don't work, why should you give them, give them opioids, they always work. No, I think with ultrasound, your success rate of peripheral nerve blocks increases a lot. And the older colleagues, they don't want to use ultrasound for rigid anesthesia. So they have limited experience, and that's the reason why they don't use it. But our new colleagues, who just started as staff members, they all use ultrasound, and they all use ultrasound for peripheral nerve blocks in children. So ultrasound is nowadays an essential skill in the training of residents. What do you need for children when you start to use rigid anesthesia? You need skills, you need equipment, you need assistance and you need supportive surgical colleagues because it takes a little bit longer the induction than normally. And you need to have good nursing policies and procedures because the nurse at the ward, they need to know what you as anesthesiologist want. <coughs> About the skills, you've heard it a lot of times already. Anatomy is the foundation. A good anatomical knowledge and a three-dimensional spatial awareness is absolutely mandatory before you can safely perform rigid anesthesia. And successful use of ultrasound may be demand more training and a more detailed knowledge of anatomy than with the former techniques. There's a lot of information available already. A lot of books pay attention to pediatric rigid anesthesia with ultrasound. A lot of papers are available, so there is no uh, lack of theoretical knowledge. It should be. The equipment, you need, of course, nerve localization equipment like a nerve stimulator, ultrasound machine. Yes, and I still mention nerve stimulator, but I'll come back on that later. Needles, you can use all needles. Catheters, we already talked about it, non-insulated versus insulated, versus uh, non-stimulating versus stimulating catheters. Medication, we always use ropivacaine, but you can also, of course, use levopivacaine, and you need infusion pumps. Maybe with nerve, the nerve stimulator will not be longer necessary. Because we say the only predictor for successful block is circumferential spread of local anesthetic around the nerve. But sometimes it's quite hard. For example, in this case, you see a child with arteriogroposis multiplex, and you see here all calcula in the... Do you have a pointer? No. You see the calculus, the deposits in the image, and it's quite hard to say what's the sciatic nerve, what's the subcritical sciatic nerve. By putting a needle in the close vicinity and stimulate, you can see, oh, thank you very much. A 
And by putting a needle close to the vicinity of the nerve, you can stimulate and you can prove that this actually was the sciatic nerve and that this was not the subcutial sciatic nerve, although they look similar as a subcutial sciatic nerve. And you see when we inject below the sciatic nerve, you see actually below there's even a calculus of uh, a calculus deposit below the sciatic nerve. Here you see the introduction of the catheter below the nerve and it worked. So sometimes you still need uh, uh, electrical nerve stimulation. But remember that in children you don't need to go as low as below 0.5 milliamps. It's proven that you may go higher between 0.5 and 1 milliamp. And when you use ultrasound, just use your nerve stimulation as confirmation what you have seen, as functional information. In children, you need special transducers. You can do your blocks with a linear, normal linear probe, but when you have very small children, it's better to use the hockey stick probe, which has the same characteristics as the, the, the normal linear probe, only the footprint is smaller. And in children, we use the same equipment as in adults. We use actually the same catheters, the same size of the needles as in, 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 uh, in adults. Because there is no equipment available for these small, small children. We have to do it with this. I said already, do we still need nerve stimulation and on the catheters? Yeah, maybe. But it's not so sure any, I'm not so sure anymore if it's necessary in all cases. Then I'm going to go over a lot of blocks, upper extremity and lower extremity. And you see there's already a lot of published about these, so actually there's not so much new to tell. Here you see the intersclean brachial plex block, and we put the children asleep, and in children, an intersclean brachial plex block under general anesthesia is not an issue. And in adults, everybody is talking about this, don't do it asleep. Actually, in the Netherlands, when we have a very good indication to do intersclean blocks also in a sleep patients, we do it in a sleep patients. But we'll come on back to the subject, I think, later on this afternoon. Um, this is a child with a femur fibula ulna syndrome, so she has no arms and no legs. And you see here um, a malformation which has to be excised. And this child got an intersclean brachial plex block. This is not possible to do with nerve stimulation because you cannot see which muscles are moving. Then a superclavicular nerve block. Also in children, you can use superclavicular nerve blocks. You won't do it with nerve stimulation alone, and you won't do it blindly, but with, nerve with, with ultrasound, you will do it. And again, the same things as we have seen before. You identify the structures, identify the rib, identify the subclavian artery, and lateral posterior of it, you will see the brachial plexus. And introduce your needle in this corner pocket and um, inject your local anesthetic. We use for the superclavicular super block, we use a little bit bigger volumes than we use in the intersclean brachial plex block. For example, we use normally 0.2 ml per kilogram of ropivacina 0.375% instead of the, in the intersclean, we use 0.1 ml per kilogram. So we use a little bit higher doses for the superclavicular. And what should we do? Should we do a superclavicular or interclavicular block? That's always the question. Both are effective in children. There's no way to say that you don't have big arguments to say you should do an ultrasound-guided superclavicular because the success rate is higher than infraclavicular. They are both effective. Choose the one, the technique. Choose the technique where you're familiar with. <coughs> And we are very familiar with this technique, the proximal infraclavicular block. Here you see the subclavian artery. On top of it, you see here the brachial plexus. And with an out-of-plane technique, we block here the complete medial plexus, uh, the, the infraclavicular plexus on the medial side. And be aware, observe the pleura. And again, I want to stress it out, if you have the possibility abduct the arm because by abduction of the arm you make the distance between the, the pleura and the plexus bigger so it's safer technique but you must be able to do it the auxiliary block for this block use the smallest transducer possible because otherwise you have a very long trajectory and we always introduce the needle from superior 
to, um, uh, to infer you with an in-plane approach because we want to see the needle, where is it going, but there's nothing wrong to use an out-of-plane technique when you have difficulty with introducing the needle. And if you can't identify the radial nerve, which is sometimes very hard in children, sometimes very hard to see, then inject below, between your artery and your conjoint tendon. If you inject your local anesthetic in this corner here, your radial nerve will be blocked. It is a very constant relationship between the latissimus dorsi, conjoint tendon of the latissimus dorsi and the TS major and the brachial artery. And you see, you can use this block in even very short children. This is one of my smallest children. This child had a congenital malformation and um, was born with this defect and we had to amputate the arm. And you can see we here we used a brachial plex block, an axillary brachial plex block. This is one of my smallest childs I've done. Um, what should we use? Again, an infraclavicular versus an axillary block, it doesn't matter. Only with the infraclavicular block, maybe you have more complete blocks than with an axillary block. But again, use the technique where you're familiar with. Then we go to the lower extremities. Femoral blocks are very easy to do. You can even do it blindly on the street, what we do in the Netherlands when we are called in accidents with femur fractures, then we do it blindly. With the ultrasound, you can see what you are doing. Here you see the femoral nerve, and here we use an in-plane technique to go to the femoral nerve and to place our local anesthetic below the femoral nerve and below the fasci iliaca. It's a very simple block, and when you don't do blocks, start with this. It's safe. And of course, you may also use an out-of-plane technique for this block. So pretty sciatic nerve block, we already said it. Um, the size of the child, of course, determine the type of the probe you use. Um, sometimes it's very helpful to palpate for the groove between the semitendinous and semimembranous muscle. And the tendon, here you see the tendon, of the long head of the bicep femoris can be an internal landmark. Use these things. And of course, again, you can also here you see this landmark even better. The S-shaped, I talked about it yesterday. It always ends above the sciatic nerve. And inject 0.2 ml per kilogram of local anesthetic for this block. The distal sciatic nerve block, even simpler, I think, because it's more superficial, a little bit more superficial, the round structure. And again, you can use both techniques. You can use an in-plane technique or an out-of-plane technique. And here you see the film of the contiplex C catheter. We did it last week. This is, was something new in children, I think. You see here the catheter. The needle is already withdrawn. You see here a little bit, because of the anatrosopy, it's not very clear to see, but here is the sciatic nerve, this is sciatic nerve. We've chosen an in-plane approach. Here you see the catheter, it ends. You see, it's very hard to visualize the catheter in plane, but you can see it along its complete trajectory. And here you see the sciatic nerve, and now they start to inject the local anesthetic, and you see it all around. Here's the tip, and here you see the local anesthetic spreading around the nerve. This is, a, I think, a very promising technique, also in children. What are the indications for continuous peripheral nerve blocks? Of course, same as in adults, when we expect moderate to severe postoperative pain. And what is, what is this in children? Most of the time it's extensive bone surgery, reconstructive surgery, oncologic orthopedic surgery. These are the indications for blocks in children. Most of the time these, these, these procedures are performed in the lower extremities, so we have more experience in our hospital with the lower extremity blocks than the upper extremity blocks. Um, and of course, you can use it when you have an expected difficult rehabilitation trajectory. For example, ligamentoplasties, or when you do arthrolysis, although it's very, very uncommon in children. And in France, they also use peripheral nerve blocks in children for the treatment of regular pain syndrome and phantom pain treatments. And they send patients, children home with catheters. Of course, there also are also contraindications to peripheral nerve blocks in children. When there are severe coagulation disorders, although, although very seldom, severe systemic infections is a bit relative, I think. An infection at the needle insertion site, of course, is an absolute contraindication. Allergy, I've never seen them in children. And neuropathy, 
have seen little neuropathies in children. And then again, it's a relative contraindication. Coagulation disorders. This is actually not a coagulation disorder, but this is a child. You see the bluish color of the leg. These are venous malformations all over the leg, extending to the, to the um, lumbar region. And this child had a very severe malformation on the knee, and they amputated the leg because of this. It was not, they were not able to save the leg, so they had to amputate it. And we could not place an epidural or caudal because the child had also venous malformations in the lumbar region and around the vertebrae imaging before. So we, we, we thought we needed to do something for the child for the postoperative pain relief. And although there here a lot of venous malformation, we decided to place a continuous peripheral nerve block, a continuous sciatic nerve block. And here you see on the image, you see the veins all around the leg. Here you see the distal sciatic nerve. But you here see a, path, a pathway where it's able to go with your needle, but there are no veins. So with ultrasound, you can do this block in children as well. And this is an issue where it's always talked about in children. Continuous peripheral nerve block and compartment syndrome. Surgeons are very reluctant and very afraid of the compartment syndrome. But in our hospital, we were afraid of it, but we have made good, um, uh, we had a good understanding with our surgeons, and we discussed this problem, and we made some internal guidelines in our hospital. There's a risk for compartment syndrome, yes, when there's a supracondylar humeral fracture, when you have extensive fractures of the lower arm with an ulna and a fracture of the radius, in tibial fractures, um, long, to, long surgery and little to positions, and long duration surgery. The symptoms, the classical symptoms of compartment syndrome, we know it, are the five Ps, pale paresthesia, paralysis, and pulse absent, and hypoesthesia and severe ischemic pain are a lot of are very alarming symptoms. And a very important sign is need for more analgesia. When a child has a block, a continuous peripheral nerve block, which functions very well in the recovery room, and a child goes to the ward and the nurse is phoning us, the child has severe pain, although your block is there, then we're always going to take a look what's happening. Is there a compartment syndrome? And the last one is a very important risk identification and observation is crucial. So when there is a risk for a compartment syndrome, we make a very good, um, uh, we have a discussion with the surgeon and we discuss who's taking care of the child afterwards. My resident is going until 11 o'clock in the night. This orthopedic resident is going during the night to observe the child. So we make good appointment about it. So we have some practical guidelines in our hospital. The surgeon, he identifies the elevated risk for the compartment syndrome. When he has said to us there's a higher risk for compartment syndrome, we decrease the dose of local anesthetic. We go to 0.1. Uh, we go to 1 milligram per milliliter of ropivacaine instead of the 2 milligrams because we think if pain comes, there's earlier breakthrough pain. We avoid circumferential plasters and we monitor the child very strictly for the need for analgetics. Of course, temperature, uh, saturation of the leg, what we measure, and we might measure the motor function of the leg. That's also our practical guideline which we use in our hospital, and this way we never have any discussions about placing a catheter in a child or not. These are the indications. You, we already talked about it, a lot of indications for continuous peripheral nerve blocks. The infusion regimens, Normally we use, in normal children, we use 0.1 ml per kilogram of ropivacaine, 0 .2, uh, of ropivacaine 2 milligrams per milliliter. So a very uh, low dose, I think, of continuous infusion. There are some problems with the catheters. You can see it. Most of them are technical problems. They fall out, partial blocks, and malpositioned catheters. So the same problems as in adults. In conclusion, I have actually nothing new to tell. That's my first conclusion. Second conclusion, do the same thing with children as you do in adults. Provide adequate pain relief and don't be afraid of children. It's actually very easy to place captors in children, more easy than in adults. Thank you very much.